Okay, uh, TEDS is basically, in, you know, in a nutshell, it's basically just a method of, of getting the transducer information, calibration information, manufacture, and uh, you know the the date when it was calibrated onto the actual transducer. Uh, it's a uh, physical device is just uh, as you can see on the screen. It's just a small uh, chip that goes uh, in inside the load cell if possible, and and uh, in some cases, we, we put it in line uh, or on, in a connector connected to the uh, uh, load cell. Um, see, it complies with IEEE 1451.4 uh, standards. I'll, I'll start talking about that in a minute. Uh, and uh, basically, it, w it was a way of standardizing the way that the information for any sensor containing this uh, is, is made so that the instrumentation can basically look at all these different sensors and basically pull the relevant data in the same way from, from the sensor. Okay, Nikki. Well, the history of TEDS was, well, as I said, started in 1996 uh, to come up with an idea of how, how we would do this, uh, how we would interface sensors to instrumentation in a standard way. Uh, National Instruments, as you can see, they're their little symbol down there. Uh, they, they make software, LabVIEW software, and they, they also make hardware that talks to sensors all day long. And uh, it really interested them to get into a, a system where, where they could say, oh, hey, you sensor manufacturers, do it all like this so that all of our stuff can talk to all your stuff. And uh, that's where 1451.4 came from. Uh, Dallas Semiconductor, created the original TEDS chip. It only uses two wires. It's a little memory chip. And because it only uses two wires, it, it fits in pretty well with, with sensor interfaces. So you only have to add, at the most, another an additional two wires to your, to your actual physical uh, cable or connector. Um, Dallas had been producing this stuff for, for quite a while. And each of those chips has a unique identifier uh, serial number on it to begin with. Uh, we actually used these uh, chips even before we started uh, using TEDS, so it, it actually worked out quite well. So the goal was to produce a standard for manufacturers to store ID calibration data on the sensor itself, allowing the instrumentation manufacturers to design equipment that could read data on any sensor. The result was TEDS. The TEDS template is basically the information that's stored on the, on the sensor. Uh, as you can see, there's this uh, template description language. Basically, that was a language that, uh, it's similar to a, like a computer programming language. Uh, it's what was come up with to allow manufacturers to enter the information into the, the TEDS template. And what it does is it, it physically compresses the information to a very small uh, footprint. And uh, on that uh, diagram, you can see there's a basic TEDS, which is 64 bits. And then there's a, a few other small things. And there's the standard template, which is uh, are numbered from uh, 25 to 39. This particular data that you see right here fits all fits in about 400 bits of information, which is very, very tiny. Um, the basic TEDS, you can see, includes the manufacturer information and the uh, model and, and serial number of, of the transducer. Template 33 is the most common one that was used for load cells. Uh, as you can see on the, on the little chart in there, th this is basically the, the information we, we ship with, with all of our uh, load cells. And uh, you can see the basic TEDs up at the top. Uh, that's all the information was on the the previous page, and uh, template 33 gives all the actual <coughs> excuse me computer information or uh, the actual information for the calibration uh, that's in there. And as you can see, for example, bridge type is is a full bridge, uh, bridge impedance, you know, 350 ohms roughly. Uh, so all that information is stored in there. Uh, the calibration on, on this basic template is only basically a two-point calibration. 
uh, generally speaking for, for somebody with, with an indicator and they just want to hook a load cell to it and get a good reading, this, this is plenty. Uh, there are other templates uh, that are out there. Uh, there's one for a voltage output sensor, there's ones for 4 to 20 loop powered sensors, um, and of course obviously for all the, the pressure and everything else that, that's out there, there's um, several more of these. Okay, right now I'm going to turn this over to uh, to Jeff so he can talk about why we need TEDs. Appreciated. Thanks, Jay. Much appreciated. Uh, I wanted to go over, um, you know, why and when do you need TEDs? Uh, it, there are a number of reasons to use TEDs, especially when you have a data acquisition with many channels where you're testing um, load cells and you need the calibration data uh, stored in a timely fashion. Multi-channel tests are essentially expedited by permitting sensors to communicate with their calibration value, and in this case, as Jay had mentioned, model, model number, serial number, and other specifications that are utilized by that equipment. Um, intelligent signal conditioning equipment may interrogate those sensors for their calibration data, and they automatically normalize their output signals. Um, the other issue is the paperwork paperwork and bookkeeping errors, they are reduced while maintaining conformance to ISO calibration and record keeping requirements, which uh, most everyone that we deal with, especially on the testing side of the business, uh, uh, have to deal with that requirement. There's a, a significant reduction of hardware and software setup time as well when using TEDs. All that information gets uh, transmitted directly to the, uh, the DAC system and uh, executed uh, as, uh, as the setup details. The elimination of tracing through multiple cables to find properties of the attached sensor is also another, another uh, reason to use TEDs. For those of you that see the dog in the background, that's, uh, that's my mascot on the East Coast, so uh, sometimes he comes in and barks every now and then. So. <laughs> so anyway, next slide, Nikki. Can we build TEDs into any force sensor? Uh, we can build TEDs internally uh, to the sensor or in line. Uh, essentially, the cost to integrate TEDs um, into a force sensor uh, price-wise is roughly about $100 to add it. Uh, it can certainly save uh, save in terms of time, uh, again, depending on the number of channels of load cells and the applications that you have. Um, so it pays for itself, and the return on investment uh, is certainly one that you want to take a look at, especially long term. Next slide, Nikki. Um, we have a, a gold standard uh, which Interface had introduced uh, a long while ago uh, prior to me coming on board. Uh, essentially, uh, it is all traceable to NIST standards. Uh, NIST, as a matter of fact, uses a dead weight tester in a lot of the applications to test our load cells. Uh, so when we, when we say these are gold standards, uh, customers can look to interface to have that real-time NIST integrity data uh, right into that load cell. Uh, we also have uh, high-precision cells as well on the Platinum series. Um, so depending on the application and the critical nature of the application, you can certainly go with one of the gold standards or certainly any of our other, uh, our other units as well. The, uh, the gold standard really gives you the accuracy that you're looking for in terms of nonlinearity, hysteresis, and repeatability. So if those are all critical uh, to you in your application, you want to go with the gold standard when possible. Next slide, Nikki. We have a number of uh, instruments uh, to support your requirements as well that will uh, talk to TEDs. Uh, there's, they're fully uh, compatible instrumentation with TEDs, 
The 9840 is uh, one of the instruments that we have. That'll store up to a certain number of load cells or sensors. Uh, but this integration with TEDS with our instruments really eliminates the need to manually type in uh, or, or do data entry into our instruments themselves. That in itself, depending again, depending on number of channels of data, uh, it can certainly take quite a while to type in all that data manually. So TED really uh, streamlines the process and talks to the instruments themselves to uh, to give you seamless input. Next slide, Nikki. Uh, Programming TEDs, we can certainly do that. Our service department uh, certainly has the capability to program TEDs as well for you. Um, you can integrate TEDs into existing sensors as well. So if you have an existing sensor where you want TEDs integrated into that, uh, that's something that we can do depending on the connector that you, that you have on the end and what some of the requirements are, are on that. And you can purchase third-party software and hardware to program TEDs it yourself, and that average cost is listed up on the slide. Uh, but again, uh, I think the return on investment long-term with a cost such as that, uh, it certainly will pay for itself uh, you know, within a year's period, depending on the amount of testing that you're doing. Next slide, Nikki. So for this future of TED slide, I was going to open Jay up and uh, let Jay and Jeff and possibly Keith here have a little conversation about the future of TEDs and where we see that going. All right, this is uh, Jay again. Uh, obviously, the Internet of Things is everywhere nowadays, and there there is quite a bit of interest in this uh, out with the uh, customers in the field. Uh, one, one of the problems with, with standards is it takes years for these standards to be developed. Uh, and so when, when something new comes along really fast, it, it, it tends to be a, a lagging uh, element with, with the, uh, the standard. There is already a, a standard for wireless TEDS communication out there. It's 1451.5. So there, there basically is a framework for this already. Uh, you, you could create a, a, a device which would read a TEDS chip on a sensor and then transmit that information wirelessly. So, yeah, I, I guess the Internet of Things is already kind of covered. Uh, what we'll have to do is, is wait to see how the industry shakes the stuff out and how they use it. What do you think, Jeff? So... In terms of what Jay had elaborated to, you know, where, where do we see the, uh, the future advantages and where, where are things going? Um, wireless seems to be uh, an interesting topic of discussion moving forward. Um, so feeling here is that integration with wireless transceivers is, is certainly in the cards. Uh, some of the things that we have interest in is going to be uh, data transmission times, um, some of the connectorization commonality in terms of uh, on a DAC itself and some of the wired connections. Um, so there's a, a number of things that we'll be looking at in the future in terms of a wireless solution. Uh, also, the, uh, the future for TEDS, uh, there are certainly, uh, there's a large installed base of people using TEDS today. Uh, the elimination of large lengths of analog wiring is really something that I think a lot of folks are looking forward to. Uh, and, and people can certainly uh, understand that uh, given the technology features today that you have in a lot of your, uh, your personal equipment at home with, with computers and whatnot, uh, getting rid of wires is certainly something that everybody's looking forward to. So, so I think uh, the large emphasis is really on the, uh, uh, the wireless side. Keith, anything to add? Yeah, I would comment that as we move forward, I've noticed uh, sort of a requirement from customers that uh, stuff they get just 
plugs together and works, where in the past maybe people like to study manuals and had the time to really understand equipment, whereas nowadays they may just want something that works without um, having to understand how to set it up. So TED helps a lot with that. And the system can go out and you know, any end user can plug it together and it works without having to really understand the intricacies of the system. One, one other thing uh, that I did want to add uh, as well to the audience, uh, virtual TEDs is something that uh, is of interest to us today. And I believe it's, it's something that we're currently investigating to get a little more entrenched into. Um, but in terms of virtual, virtual TEDs, essentially that's a library uh, of the actual data sheets themselves that uh, people can reference and, and pretty much build up on their own. And that's something that uh, I think in the future we'll be teaming up with uh, somebody like TI or, or uh, one of the other uh, uh, companies in terms of software integration, getting that uh, loaded to their library. So. So stay tuned, uh, more to come in the future from us, and uh, hopefully we're working uh, in the right direction. Thank you all for attending. Uh, appreciate it. Hold Thank up, you. Jeff. Hold up. we got some questions here. I thought you were getting off okay. easy. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question from the field, and I think Jay might be a really good one to answer this. Uh, when a template is populated, can an individual field be left blank? And I know we might have some more questions coming in about adding your own fields into TED, so let's let's let Jay talk a little bit about that. Okay, uh, I don't know if we can go back to that TED's uh, template that was on the uh, the one slide. And, and the answer is yes, it can be left blank. If you if you look down, uh, you'll notice uh, there's a, a couple of fields there. The version letter, for example, on basic TEDs is is missing because we don't have a version letter. So yeah. It can be left blank. If, if there's no information to put in there, uh, you, can, you can leave it blank. Obviously, there's things you, you absolutely want to have on there, like the serial number and the model number and uh, you know, the, uh, the calibration units and stuff like that. But uh, there, there's a few other fields that really aren't necessarily that important to the user, so that they can be left blank. Okay, I've got several more coming in right here. Um, I think we answered this one. Would cloud-based TEDS data storage be an application of managing a large network of sensors remotely? Um, I think the virtual TEDS kind of covers a little bit of that, and then how TEDS could eventually be plugging into the Internet of Things and maybe uh, really integrating with oh. a virtual TEDS. Yeah, one of the things about virtual TEDs is is you need to have you, your instrumentation it needs to be able to download that particular file and and use that and there really isn't a standard on forcing an instrument to actually do that. So it for different manufacturers will have different uh, ways of of using things like virtual TEDs. So that that is not as standard as it could be right yet. Uh, in the future, it, that's definitely a possibility of creating some sort of a cloud library of, of, of uh, uh, sensors. Okay. Um, are there concerns of reprogramming the TEDS chip once it leaves the manufacturer? Would this be a good thing or a bad thing if somebody went to reprogram their own TEDS, if they went to go and buy that software and that hardware and they reprogrammed it? Well, it's just like a, uh, any other calibration. We've, we've put a calibration date and on that in that information so if if the customer overwrites that then the calibration that we did is is basically void on, on that um, if if the customer has the ability to calibrate and wants to do calibrations and they use their own accepted calibrations and that's absolutely fine they can it's it's their uh, device they can do what they want with it so in a similar line uh, how many times can a TED's in, TED's information be written? to a transducer? Oh, I think they advertise about 10,000 times. <laughs> so wouldn't, you're, you're I wouldn't usually really good. worry about running out, huh? Yeah. OK. Well, I got one question in here that I think maybe Keith or Jeff might answer. Uh, they purchased an NIC DAC system that is TEDS capable and wanted to know if NI software can write to TEDS. That's. <laughs> 
This is Keith. That's a good question. I definitely do not know the answer to that. It's probably more hardware related and that probably there is some NI software that is capable, but it would be a hardware issue. You know, have to have hardware that's compatible with the writing as well. Um, any comments, Jay? Yeah, NI definitely makes equipment. I don't know if it's included in that particular device, but they definitely make equipment that will write to TADS. Jonathan, we're going to do some research and see if we can follow up with you on that one as well. Um, here's one. What is the transmission rate, i.e., how long does it take to query the template 33 data and transmit it? Is that pretty readily available? Um, it really depends on, on the, the speed of the processor that's in, in the device. Uh, as I said, there's only with using you know the basic TEDs and, and template 33, there's less than 400 bits of information, so it happens really quick. Uh, I, I yeah I, I don't f ever foresee yeah I mean, we're 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 talking you know maybe a microsecond or two at that point. So here's a good one. Um, does, okay, can multiple point linearization be implemented in TEDs? And I think this is really similar to the can TED store multipoint Cal data. I don't know how closely those are related, but why don't well, we talk about that? Yeah, actually, it, it's, it's, it's really the same thing. Uh, on that slide, again, you see there's, there's the basic TEDs and there's template 33. Well, there's the ability to add additional templates to that. And there are um, templates 40 to 42. Uh, deal with uh, a calibration table, uh, curve tables, and, and things like that. So you could put in multi-point calibrations in those. So what the device would do is it would read the basic TEDs, then it would read template 33, and then it would go read these uh, calibration tables and then implement all that. Uh, yet again, it, it is a case where the uh, instrumentation that's reading it has to have the ability to do something with those tables as well. There's no requirement that the instrumentation has to read every table and and or and and be able to do something with it. Nance, yes, this is Keith. I'd point out that at this time, um, the three instruments that were shown in the slide by interface do not support multi-point calibration, and I believe it's relatively uncommon for instruments to support it at this time. But it's certainly possible, and some instruments certainly do. Yeah. Uh, th in addition to that, there's also a user data field. So if the user had some special um, polynomial or something like that, some curve fitted polynomial that they wanted added to it, uh, that can be added into the user data, but there again it's up to the user to be able to figure out how to do something with that. Got a great question here from a couple people. Um, does the presence of TEDs alter ATEX explosion rating and uh, is this available for use in a class one division one hazardous areas is a really similar question so let's combine Combine those. Do you think TEDS affects ATEX and explosion rating? Um, if you if you had an ATEX load cell that did not have TEDS and wanted to add TEDS internally, yes, it would because you're adding a device uh, and you'd have to go get the device recertified at that point. If the device was certified with with TEDS in it, uh, now there's no problem. To be honest, it, it's a very low voltage device. Um, almost no energy is used in it it really wouldn't, there, there's no reason it couldn't be ATEX. Did we answer everybody's questions here? Um, if you've got any more questions, last call, it's interim in. Last reminder that we do have that handout available under the handout table for you. Um, it is the TEDS data sheet. I've also got it on the website, and when I send out the recording of the webinar, I will send a link to that as well. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us. We had great attendance today and great questions. Um, let me see if there's any more that the AE submitted that we didn't touch on. Um, how many people use TEDS? I mean, we, we want to know that TEDS is in the industry and it's going to work, so... How many people are actually using TEDS? Jeff, you want to answer that well, one? I, yeah, I could take that, Nikki. So, you know, there's there's at least 100,000 or more uh, 
deployed. It really it really depends on I think the more channels that people have in their data acquisition system, uh, the popularity of TEDs in that community is is overwhelming. So uh, it continues to grow, uh, especially uh, uh, with multi-channel uh, purposing. So TEDs is out there. Um, here's one from R A E Jack. What circumstances, in what circumstances is TEDS not so beneficial? Are there any circumstances and applications out there where TEDS really would be a hindrance instead of a helper? Um, uh, yeah, actually, because for, if, if you see on that TEDS data sheet, there's the, uh, the physical measure and uh, field there, uh, where it's on that one it says uh, uh, pounds. There are only a certain number of these. Uh, measurements that have been defined. So, you, yeah, if you're using newtons or pounds or something like that, or, or newton meters, uh, it's, it's great. If you're using um, uh, pound feet, for example, in, in torque, well, there is none for that. So you'd have to use some other, uh, uh, you'd have to use something like ounce inches. And then you wind up with these really ridiculous numbers in there. And uh, when you hook a, a, a an indicator that's reached TEDs up to a TEDs load cell it, it, or, or, or torque sensor or whatever, it basically reads that information and scales the meter to that particular uh, unit of measure. So you end up with this, you know, in, in some cases we have to do things where uh, it, it's like a 300 k, k pounds and, and you end up with a full scale uh, value on your meter of 300. You know, that's it. Just three, three numbers. So yeah, there, there, there's cases where you know it's it's, it's it, it just doesn't really fit quite well with with you know what what the user is doing. Yeah, I'll chime in um, on that, and this relates to another question too. The physical measure and is actually the engineering units assigned to that uh, sensor, and so. Number five ha ends up being pounds. There's also number two would be strain. Number seven would be meters per second squared. So there's about, that well, looks like about 45 different engineering units available for sensors. Um, and then the measure or the minimum physical value is actually the capacity of the sensor or whatever capacity you put in here. But in this case, it's 2,000 pounds plus or minus. So I got one more question that I think is pretty good before we wrap up for the day. How do TEDs behave at extreme temperatures, and what are the max min temps that TEDs can handle? Uh, I, I believe the chip is good up to uh, 125 degrees C. So generally much higher than, than well, it's certainly higher than what we uh, do our temperature compensation on our load cells for. Uh, it, it, it should survive in... in, in just about anywhere the load cell will, will work. Okay, I hope we answered all your questions about TEDs. If you have more, you can email me at nchris, that's N-K-R-I-S-S, -S, at interfaceforce.com with any additional questions, and we will follow up with you. Thanks again for joining us today. Great webinar, um, and thanks Jay and Jeff and Keith for being my backup here. Uh, have a great day. Happy Wednesday, guys.